Hey everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show here. Welcome to episode 19 of Forensics Talks. Uh, today, we are gonna make just a few announcements before we get to our guests. And just like before, like last week, let me just add this here. Um, just uh, three announcements here. So one is that uh, this is photogrammetry week. So I've been having a series of webinars. So this is the last day for the webinars. There is still time to register. Um, I'm sending out some of the recordings to people if you're interested in learning how to take photographs and then produce 3D models. I'm giving a ton of information and it's 100% free. So if you're interested, there's still time to join in on that. Um, you can just go into the website and if I can find the link here, there we go. You can just go to ai2-3d.com slash register. And like I said, this is the final day after today. You, you probably won't be able to register. Okay. Uh, also, uh, I wanted you to know that the American Academy of Forensic Science Conference is coming up. So that's on February 15th and 19th. It is going to be virtual this year. So that's a great opportunity for a lot of people who couldn't travel before. Um, you know, the fact that it can open up and you can catch a lot of presentations that you otherwise uh, wouldn't have had access to. Uh, also, there's the Association of Crime Scene Reconstruction. Now, that is a combination of in-person and virtual, and that's being held on March 2nd to 4th. So if you want to uh, attend, uh, just head over to uh, acer.org, and uh, you can register and find out more there. All righty. And let me shut that off and let's get started here. So today uh, we have uh, Professor Sherry Forbes. Uh, she holds the Canada 150 Research Chair in Forensic Thanatology at the Université de Québec à Trois-Rivières. She's the director of the first human decomposition facility in Canada for research in experimental and social thanatology. She was formerly an Australian Research Council Future Fellow from 2012 to 2016 in the Centre for uh, Forensic Science at the University of Technology, Sydney, in Australia. She established and directed the first human decomposition facility in Australia, known as the Australian Facility for Taphonomic Experimental Research, or AFTER. And prior to this, she was the founding director of the Forensic Science Program from 2005 to 2012 at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. And there she held a uh, Tier 2 Canada Research Chair decom uh, in Decomposition Chemistry. Um, Professor Forbes' research investigates the chemical processes that occur in soft tissue uh, decomposition, something that we're going to be talking about today. And her current research focuses on identifying an, um, an accurate chemical profile of decomposition order using advanced chemical instrumentation. Her research assists police uh, canine units to enhance their training protocols for cadaver detection dogs deployed to forensic and mass disaster investigations. And she's regularly requested to help out with uh, locating and recovering buried or concealed evidence, uh, including human remains, drugs, explosives, weapons, and currency. So uh, please welcome Dr. Sherry Forbes. Hello. Hello. Thank you. All right. Now you are in uh, in Trois-Rivières, Quebec. You're stuck near there somewhere like everybody else locked away. That's correct. <laughs> All righty. Well, um, what I usually do with uh, the guests is I like uh, to ask uh, them to kind of go back and before you were already in school and everything and the moment where something clicked and said I'm gonna study decomposing bodies <laughs> <laughs> when was when was that moment uh, well there were two different moments so the first was I'm going to study forensic science um, which was back in the 90s so pre CSI pre NCIS you know all the shows um, and I don't even think at the time it was really called forensic science uh, at universities. And I just really enjoyed science and I loved reading crime novels. I mean, it's such a cliche, but I, I have every Agatha Christie uh, novel on my bookshelf and I just saw that there was an opportunity to apply what I enjoyed doing professionally, you know, in science with, um, with my interests. So that's how I got into forensic science. But 
when did I decide to study decomposition? Uh, that was my final year of my undergraduate degree. And uh, I studied forensic chemistry and we spent three years learning about paint and, you know, glass and all this trace evidence. And um, I'm probably going to upset some people in the audience, but at the end of three years, I piece of trace evidence <laughs> in my life and so when we had to choose a, a project for our fourth year an entire year of research I thought I just can't I can't do paint I can't do glass and the only project that wasn't was uh, to try and identify um, this substance that was forming in a cemetery in Sydney Australia uh, not even forensic, you know, it's really environmental chemistry, but it, it you know, it was not paint or, or glass and it was also something that actually um, really drew my interest. So that was my introduction to decomposition, attending exhumations in a, in a cemetery, uh, trying to find out why bodies were preserving in this cemetery, and it obviously became really fascinating for me. So when you began, um, the what was the sort of the status of uh, forensic science in Australia? Because I know that you know the the Aussies and the Kiwis are just they're they're very highly respected in forensic science, and uh, they do a lot of good work in so many different areas. Uh, but in your particular area, was there a lot of work that had been done, or was it like wow, this is wide open? It was wide open. Uh, so when when I chose to study forensic science at university. Uh, in 1992, I'm trying to think, is about the time I decided I was going to do it, there was at that time one forensic science program in Australia. So my choice was easy. Uh, I knew exactly where I was going. And uh, obviously since then it's exploded. But um, it's not to discount the work that was being done in the government laboratories and by the police, but in terms of studying and, and university and academic research, uh, it was really the beginning around that time. So there was a lot lot of opportunity. Okay. Now you studied, uh, it was a Bachelor of Science in Applied Chemistry? Okay. Yes, Applied Chemistry and Forensic Science. It was, I guess, what they call here a double major. Um, right. Focused on both. Okay. Yeah, see, I'm, I couldn't stand chemistry. And, and I mean, I love science. I, I always love science, uh, physics, but the, you know, I, I like things that move and mechanics and things like that. So that was always my thing. But chemistry, man, I got beat up in high school in chemistry. So I had a really um, a bad experience. Uh, but anyway, so I, I mean, were you always like a chemistry kind of person or? or Oh no. oh, no, 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 no. Also, this might get me in trouble, but chemistry was probably my worst subject. Uh, <laughs> I, I preferred physics and math, but there was no forensic physics or forensic math. Um, as I said, there was one forensic degree. It, it was chemistry. And if you wanted to study forensics, you, you studied chemistry. Um, so, but it was good because it made me a better chemist. Uh, I had studied chemistry at school. It wasn't that I didn't like it. I, it just wasn't my best subject. Um, but no, it was good to, to improve those skills at university. <laughs> okay. And then when you, uh, so when you were working on your PhD, what did you study or what did you focus on? Uh, for so, your uh, yeah, at the end of this, this study in the cemetery, we identified um, the reason bodies weren't decomposing was because the, this particular area of the cemetery was on a significant slope and, and was very close to the groundwater table by the time you bury a body, which is six to eight feet subsurface. Um, the graves were becoming waterlogged and a, a substance known as adipose was, was forming on the bodies and it actually has a preserving effect on soft tissue. So we identified that in my undergraduate project and then that became my PhD. So I spent three years learning everything I could about why does adipocere form, what conditions are conducive, what prohibit, uh, if it forms, how can we get, you know, get it to decompose because that's what the cemetery industry needed. Um, but through that, it also became forensic. So we did have forensic burials that we also studied or that I studied. Um, and yeah, at the end of it, I just know a lot of more, lot more about adipocere. <laughs> well, let's let's get into it because that's something I was going to ask you about it. I mean, uh, sometimes I leave the research portion later, but I mean, I think um, and I think you know I want to talk about the the obviously the uh, the facility you have 
uh, where you study decompo decomposing bottle, uh, bodies. And I also want to talk about cadaver dogs and uh, VOCs and stuff like that. Um, but uh, in looking at the research that you've done since 2000 and a lot of your peer reviewed papers from about 2000 to 2010, there was a lot of work on adipose here. And so I was looking at it, it's like adipose here, adipose here. So I'm like, wait a second, she's discovered something here. Like there's something going on. And then after there's this transition, uh, more into VOCs and a lot of different variables that affect, um, um, you know, uh, decomposition and that sort of thing. So what, uh, can, can you give us a bit more on just, and cause not everybody watching may be in this particular area. So what is adipose here? Absolutely. So adipose here, sort of like the term sounds comes from adipose tissue in the body. Uh, so it's, it's normally the fats would liquefy and decompose and, and disappear into the surrounding environment, whether that was soil or water or clothing. Uh, but under certain conditions, uh, it, they can actually form a, a solid product. So it's a series of saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. To look at, it's like a white, waxy uh, or soapy substance. And when it forms, it often sort of infiltrates around the body where the fat tissue normally would be. Uh, and it can actually help to preserve organs. It can pre preserve muscle. It can preserve, you know, quite a, a lot of the body, depending how much of it forms. Um, so I, I guess we were more interested in the chemistry of, of its formation. As I said, why does it form in some environments and not others? Um, and because it is a, a hydrolysis process, it needs water, um, we now know and, and we did know that it, it does form in very waterlogged environments, such as graves that are filled with water. Um, but it's also very common in, in water, like lake environments, rivers, creeks, um, often with drowned victims as well. So, um, yeah, so I guess that, that was what we're trying to study. I set up a a sort of mini facility indoors in my laboratory and set up all these scenarios with soils and mock coffins and you know you name it we had it in there to to establish that but ultimately we we have a pretty good understanding now i think of what, what causes it to form well what what when does it not form uh, it doesn't form when there's no moisture or when there's no water. So, um, and the converse to adipose formation is often desiccation or mummification of the body when the, the tissue dries out really quickly and we get that sort of leathery appearance that looks like a, you know, what we think of as a mummy, um, a natural mummy or an artificial mummy. So that's the main reason. Uh, but, you know, like all science, you kind of prove yourself wrong every day. Um, so as soon as I said it was only in water environments, of course, we've since found that you can find it in semi-dry environments, uh, mostly because the body has enough water. We're made up of, of predominantly water, and, and as long as it doesn't dry out too quickly, the body can form out of the sear on its own. So okay. yeah. now are you uh, and like I said, so over those over that span of time and even up to today, you um, you know you, if you find you know adipose here on the body, does the adipose here as well change over time? Does it is there things you can determine about um, you know the the chronology or the time or something? That was really my hope uh, to try and correlate it with time since death or post-mortem interval. Um, it's true it does change, but in fact it, it changes to start to degrade. Uh, so sometimes it just maintains its stability for hundreds or thousands of years, but other times it will start to change, but then we lose it. Um, so I guess it was a disappointment for me that I couldn't correlate it to decomposition stages and timeframes. Uh, but the, the good thing is we're focusing on other lipid, um, what we call biomarkers in the body to, to see if perhaps they correlate better with time since death. So that's research we're still doing today. Okay. Now, so for, for my benefit and others, when we talk about uh, volatile organic compounds or VOCs, what are we talking about really? What kinds of things are we, we considering? Uh, so they can be small or large molecules, but they're ones that basically have a, a, a desire to go into the air, really. So um, anything in the body can decompose and, it, you know, we're solid and we're liquid, but ultimately parts of us can become gases. Um, what we're interested in is those volatile compounds that make up what we call decomposition scent or decomposition odour. And the reason we're interested in those is because we know uh, cadaver detection dogs, also known as human remains detection dogs, use these to locate victim remains or human remains. 
Um, so whilst there's hundreds and hundreds of these compounds, uh, even during life, we have natural volatile organic compounds around us. Um, we're trying to isolate those few that we think the dogs may be using uh, to, to, to locate decomposed bodies. Okay. And uh, so a question I had when I was, I was uh, reading some of the materials last night was, um, are there, uh, for example, stages where, you know, you start off with the body starts decomposing and you start, you get certain chemicals and then you, you get different chemicals and you continually there's, you know, how many stages would you say there are and what kind of chemicals um, can you expect to see in each of these stages? Yeah, so our traditional, and I say traditional because nothing ever follows uh, the traditional stages, but typically we refer to five stages, uh, the fresh or immediately after death, uh, the stage where the body starts to bloat, and this, of course, is quite gaseous and odorous, um, into our active decay stage, followed by a more advanced stage, and then the final stage. Now, the final stage can vary. It could be skeletonization, it could be mummification, it could be adipose formation, a combination of those. But that's traditionally what we know. And certainly the odour changes with time. Um, this is another one of our challenges is knowing how the dogs can locate somebody who's only been deceased for a day versus skeletal remains that are fragmented and scattered over a large area. Um, we have to we have to analyse all of those stages uh, and that's what we do at the facility to, to try and make sure we're capturing how those volatiles change over time. Oh, interesting. Now, what about, um, uh, so when, when, a, when a body is decomposing, um, I'm assuming that there are chemicals that are just going to be very common between all of us because we're all kind of made up of the same stuff. And I'm, but I'm also wondering if we all have a unique odor or whatever, are there sometimes uh, higher proportions of certain chemicals for different people or, or whatever, or I mean, I'm I'm thinking about all the different variables, which there are probably a ton of, yeah. because there's soil, there's right, there's all there's all these other factors, right? So, have you seen? I mean, are are the chemicals highly sensitive to the different types of environments and variables? So I'll go back to the first part about us being unique in in our human scent, which is true. Um, we we do all have our own unique human scent during life. Uh, it's how dogs can be used to actually find a missing person. If you present an article of clothing that smells like them, they can follow that. Um, but thankfully for us, after death, it, the odour becomes more generic. So, yes, there's certainly hundreds of compounds that are consistent across all people, you know, because our proteins, our lipids, they all decompose very similarly. Um and then there's also differences, uh, but we don't focus on the differences because we don't want to identify a specific person. We're trying to find human remains. Um, so we have what we're trying to do basically is to find which of those compounds consistently appear over all stages of decomposition in different environments. So when can we see them in a burial environment? When do we see them in water? If a, if a person's concealed in a vehicle, you know, all these different scenarios. And if a, a dozen or so perhaps, and I'm hypothesising, a dozen or so compounds consistently appear, then we start to think that perhaps these are the ones the dogs already know. Um, they, of course, know the answer. We're just trying to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> right. And um, so what kind of a dog um, makes for a good cadaver dog? Oh, well, th that's a controversial uh, question and the police will tell you many different things. Um, but I have personally trained in Australia. We tend to use, uh, we did use, but they still do, or not there now, uh, English Springer Spaniels. And um, that's much more to do with their, their temperament and also their ability to search over very large areas in fairly warm climates um, for long periods of time. So they're high intensity, high drive, lots of energy, and they they would literally run until they dropped dead. Um, I say this because I own one. She's a failed cadaver dog uh, from Australia, English Springer Spaniel, and I have to stop her from running because she just won't stop. Um, here, though, they, they tend to use Labradors. Uh, sometimes they cross-train the, the shepherds for the general purpose dogs with, with cadaver as well. There's no, as far as I'm going to say, there's no perfect dog. Uh, it's about having a dog that has that drive and that desire to search 
and who gets satisfaction from the reward of searching, which is usually to play with their handler with their favourite ball or, or tug toy. When you were describing Izzy, your dog, I thought, man, I said, she might be describing me too. <laughs> Easily distracted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. There's a reason she failed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, with respect to the dogs and, um, and training, you have to isolate these compounds and then you have to somehow uh, give them, you know, a particular scent to follow. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is it something that you can, for example, manufacture offline or something you can collect and keep and then, you know, say, okay, here's a, here's a, what I call it, like a, an exemplar scent to follow and then go from there. How do you, how do you go about training and, and collecting everything that you need for the dogs? Yeah, so originally that was our plan, was to, to try and make a what we call a synthetic formulation. So to identify these chemicals, put them into a solvent or a liquid form and, and present this. And, and that's some of the work we did in Australia. Um, to a degree it works, but I think ultimately what we've come to realise here in Canada as well as in Australia is um, the best training aids are the real thing. Uh, you know, if we want drug dogs to find real drugs, we present them with real drugs, the same for explosives. Um, so at the moment, we've sort of moved away from those synthetic formulations and we're looking at how can we transfer that odour, the real odour, onto a substrate that is not so dangerous for them. So it's not like giving them human remains to work with, um, but it's giving them something else, whether it's a, a gauze or a towel or something else that they can consistently use for training the dog and they know it holds the real odour. Um, and so that's our challenge at the moment. It's more now about how do you keep an odour from disappearing? You know, every time they open the, the container and, and things like this, and how long can we store it? How do we store it? Um, there's a lot of those kind of logistics that we're getting into now. Interesting. So with respect to the cadaver dogs, then it sounds to me like it, this is also an area that is still, I'll say, relatively new. Yeah, definitely. And, and the greatest challenge for all of the handlers that I work with is, is that access to the training aids. Um, it's not like drug detection or explosive detection where they have access to those materials and, and legally and ethically they're allowed to. Um, here in Canada, the same in Australia, most places in the world, ethically and legally, they're not allowed to hold human remains. Um, but yet we expect their dogs to find them, you know. So this is this is a challenge that we're working on uh, and for, for both sides, both the science and the, the canine handlers. Okay. Um, well, let me ask you a little bit about the uh, your facility, the decomposition facility, also known as the body farm. Um, but uh, there was uh, th there was actually an interview that you had done, and I was I, I was watching and, and following up on a couple of things, and I found it interesting because um, it said that you know we don't really have a good understanding of how bodies decompose uh, decompose in mm -hmm. let's say in Canada, but also in maybe some other places in the world and sort of tied into that um there was a woman uh, i believe her name was uh juliana Maisonot, and she talks about entomology and she says that you know we don't even have a good handle you know handle on the bugs in canada you know or, or what happens in the winter and i said we don't geez that's interesting so um this is something that you're working on trying to understand better yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the one thing we can say we know is how important the local climate is to the process of decomposition. So, um, you know, we, we can study decomposition in Vancouver, but we certainly couldn't then try to apply that knowledge to Ontario or to Quebec or the eastern part of Canada because the climate is so different and it varies seasonally within a year. Um, and as Julie said, uh, we don't even know which insects come to a body in many of these places. Uh, there's limited, you know, forensic scientists out there who, who are doing the research and, and we do what we can, but we can't cover every climate in Canada and, and the rest of the world. Um, so for us, it's, it's very much about helping uh, our local police and, and then seeing if we can extrapolate it further. But where we can't, then we just try and encourage other people to do the research in those areas. Uh, and long term with the facility, it's currently the only one in Canada, but that's by no means useful to everyone. So we want to expand to have more facilities in the future. What kind of things happen with, I mean, you know, obviously it's winter now. So when, when the body's frozen or let's say the body is, you know, covered under, you know, uh, 40 centimeters of snow. I mean, what kind of, I mean, I'm assuming there's just a slowdown in some of the processes, but are there still things that happen 
uh, close to the yeah. ground or underneath the body where when it's in contact with the soil? Absolutely. So um, this is our first winter at the facility. So we're learning every single day. Uh, but thankfully, we did sort of practice our methods with pig carcasses in the, the previous winter. So we have an idea. Um, but yeah, I mean, even though we're at sub zero temperatures, things are still happening. Some bacteria can survive and do continue to, you know, do what they do, which is de decompose tissue. It's on a very microscopic scale, but it happens. Um, we identified, in fact, Julie, our entomologist, found that there's some insects that effectively hibernate. So they're there right before the snow comes or right before the temperatures decline below zero. And then they just kind of go into this diapause and do nothing. And then as soon as it gets above zero, they reemerge. And, uh, you know, that's really important because we use insects to estimate time since death. And if we didn't know that, I mean, we could be losing six months of our estimation just mm -hmm. assuming they weren't there and they've actually just gone to sleep. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's fascinating what still goes on. Even, you know, soil temperatures can stay warmer um, so we can get some sort of melt occurring around the remains that you don't see elsewhere in the facility. Um, so, yeah, we're learning a lot day by day. Uh, and I think over, over time we'll get a, a better understanding. Visually, it certainly seems like nothing's happening. It looks, you know, like just preservation. Right, um, right. But I think what's most interesting for us is what happens once that freeze and then the thaw cycle happens. Um, because come spring, the bodies will thaw and all these things that have gone to sleep will re-emerge, bacteria, insects, and it, I suspect, will completely change the way a body decomposes. It wouldn't be the same as if we had a body placed in the spring. They would actually decompose very differently. Yeah, I, I want to come back to the, uh, um, the the facility, but I was just thinking about, um, you know, tomorrow you feel like, hey, I, I feel like I'm going to open up a facility, you know what I mean? So, you know, you go and, uh, you know, you apply and, uh, you know, a couple of days later you get your permit. So what we, I'm, ask, I'm curious to know uh, who you have to convince and uh, <laughs> Who yeah. has to become very friendly with? <laughs> it, it wasn't that quick, but uh, yeah, I wish it was. Um, yeah, who you know, honestly, and, and in all seriousness, the the first um, the first people you really have to talk to is the community where you want to do this. Uh, I learned that in Australia, and and we did that here because if you don't have the support of the community, then nothing else matters. It doesn't matter how many permits you get; um, you need that community to support the research. So we did that first. Uh, we found the land that we wanted to work with and, and then we, we had many meetings with the community and the, um, what do you call it, like the, the city council for that area and everyone else um, to make sure they were on board. And then once we did that, we started with the permits. So it's, it's usually environmental, um, certainly showing that we're not contaminating uh, the site and, and that we're not you know, going to be contaminating drinking water or anything like that. And then public health or, you know, the equivalent of sort of Health Canada um, to, to confirm with them that we're also not going to be introducing any infectious diseases into the community, which now, of course, is an even bigger deal. Um, and, yeah, so those are the kind of permits. We actually recently published a paper to tell people how we did this because I get this question a lot from people who want to start a facility and, and it's a process, you know, so it, it, we decided we'd actually put it in writing so that others might be able to do it a bit quicker. Right. Well, and was it any different uh, in Australia when you, you started there? What was different or what was similar? Yeah, I mean, it, it took longer in Australia because it was my first time learning and uh, it took, took us about four years in Australia and only two years here, but that, that was because I had prior knowledge. Um, interestingly, you know, Australia was more concerned about the health side of things and making sure that our donors didn't have infectious diseases and that we were releasing those. Um, and they were interested in the environmental aspect, but less so. Um, Canada, and perhaps this is a really good thing too, is, is much more interested in the environment. So public health were, were pretty quickly convinced that everything was safe. Um, the Ministry of Environment took longer. And uh, actually we sort of have an ongoing policy with them that will continue to monitor the site uh, to make sure we're not contaminating and to report any, any contaminants that we do identify. Okay. And uh, I mean, obviously, you don't want people walking into this place or, or whatever. So mm -hmm. I, I imagine it's fairly well protected. 
Yeah, all of these facilities um, around the world are very high security. So it's high security fence, opaque fencing you can't see in, um, infrared cameras that function 24 hours a day and emergency plans for a response if anyone should try to breach the security. Um, we've got the added feature in Canada that I didn't need in Australia of an electric fence to prevent bears and, and other large mammals that we don't have in Australia. Um, but otherwise they're all very similar and yeah, we, we take security and more importantly, the privacy of our donors um, very seriously. Uh, you currently have how many uh, how many uh, bodies there at the moment? We have five. We opened in August and we accepted donors until November. So we had um, we accepted five. We actually had to decline some. Um, one of the really, I guess, nice things that I found in Australia and here is there is no shortage of donors. The the generosity of our community and of our general public is amazing. Um, and you always worry you might open this facility and no one <laughs> will ever donate <laughs> except for me. Um, and uh, but that's never happened. And and so yeah, so we've accepted five. We're a very small facility, and we're hoping to grow in the future so we don't have to decline donations um, if if the family and the donor really wants to donate. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, shout out to the donors and uh, and future donors uh, yes. <laughs> for for this uh, for yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's something that's necessary. You're not going to learn unless you have the real thing, right? So, um, yeah, it is a really uh, I mean, it's it's really nice of people to uh, offer themselves up for for research and for knowledge, which is great. Um, in terms of um, the number of students that you currently have or, or number, because I'm assuming there's, there's now people going, Hey, uh, Hey, Sherry, uh, you know, Hey, uh, any chance we can, you know, come over and like do some work. I mean, um, I'm assuming that you have a pretty good uh, following and people that want to work with you at, at this time. So what's your current status in terms of number of, for example, projects, research students, and that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, as I said, it's a small facility. So we're, and we've only just opened, um, at the moment, I'd say we have around 15 projects that are actively running, um, winter being the exception, obviously. Um, but in terms of, uh, I did put together a list of people who had, had shown interest and we're at more than 50, five zero partners um, or potential partners. And they're sort of Canada, North America, and, and a lot of colleagues in Europe as well, um, particularly in the Scandinavian countries, because our climate will sort of mimic uh, what they would find. Um, but but the intent is is definitely to grow, um, and our mandate for every single donation is that we collect as much data as we can. Uh, so we're always encouraging collaborators, um, academic, industry, government, police, forensic scientists, coroners, whoever, uh, if there's a purpose for them to do research or have us do research that will actually be meaningful to them, we want to hear from them. So um, as I said, we're the only one in Canada for now, but I want to keep having more facilities so we can keep expanding the research. Uh, it's really important to us that everyone's donation is is 100% valuable to forensic science. Now, are, can you can you expand the current facility, or are you thinking like have a few more facilities around Canada, right? Both. Uh, yeah. I like the challenge, so I'm already talking about expanding this facility, which everyone is, you know, a little bit concerned about because we literally only just opened. But um, but the need is there. I mean, the fact that we've had so many inquiries. And we have so many donors wanting to, to come as well. Uh, so, yes, I'm already talking about opening our, expanding our facility in Quebec, but we're also hoping to open a facility in Ontario, and not me personally, but um, another academic institution there that, that I'm helping. And, uh, you know, I'd love to see one on the west coast of Canada, hoping I can convince some colleagues out there to start one and, and also on the east coast. I mean, I'd love to go from coast to coast. Um, because the reality is the climates change, uh, you know, from one side of the country to the other. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of uh, what kind of research are you uh, currently working on and what kind of research do you have planned for the future? So at the moment, my particular research is, is with the dogs and collecting volatile organic compounds. Um, but more broadly across the group, we, we're studying the entomology, so the insect life cycles. Uh, we're doing a lot of the environmental aspects, collecting soil and groundwater to, to look at um, bacterial formation and, as I mentioned, hopefully show there's no contamination, um, but also to look at how that, that microbial community 
could be used potentially to tell us something about the deposition site or maybe even how long the body has been decomposing in that site. Um, we're looking at remote sensing. So we have a student working with hyperspectral imaging, uh, looking at, at the changes in you know, the spectral analysis of the soil and vegetation. Uh, we're doing some facial reconstruction. Um, the list is, you know, I can talk for the next 10 minutes, I won't. But, yeah, we're, we're trying to, as I said, cover a lot of different areas and where we don't have the expertise, we ask our colleagues to, to do that research. We're not forensic anthropologists, so we're always asking the anthropologists to come in. I have geophysicists who do research there. You and I spoke about photogrammetry, which would be awesome. Yeah, um, yeah anyone who can add value to what we do, um, that's, that's what we're trying to do. That's, I guess, also the future answer. <laughs> what are we doing in the future? Um, I think, you know, a lot of our future research is really going to focus on that winter um, aspect because there's just so little data out there. So a lot of these facilities have been around for, for many years and we're starting to get a good understanding of what happens in warmer climates. Um, I say starting, obviously we're not there yet. Uh, but in terms of what happens under, you know, two feet of snow, we just really have no idea. Um, and, and this year it's a very much observational, but in future years I think we're going to be out there frequently trying to collect samples and seeing just what's happening more at a cellular level, I guess, um, in terms of the, the impact of the freezing and then the thawing and how that changes the whole process. Okay. Uh, when you run the training, for example, for the cadaver dogs, is it like a like a field school kind of thing where you know you invite a few people out, or like do you have regularly scheduled classes that are open to police, or how does that work? So yeah, I mean, at the moment we've we've um, it was just sort of a bit ad hoc. So I, I work with the cadaver dog handlers across Canada, and and we'd all informally talked about doing it, and so we we did that last October. Um, in the future, we definitely want it to be regular. We want to advertise it onto uh, the website for any kind of workshops that we're doing. Some of them are closed to, to police only, um, if it's police cadaver dogs or whoever. But, of course, they can all contact me and, and ask. Um, others we hope to open more to students and trainees and, and people in terms of learning how to, you know, recover human remains from a burial environment or uh, other techniques that, that might be useful, such as Julie, Julie teaches um, our crime scene technicians, how to collect insect evidence so that they know, you know, if they come across insect evidence at a crime scene, how they can collect it to be most valuable. Um, so, yeah, it, long term, lots of plans, but long term, I definitely want to have regular workshops that we can schedule in advance so, so people can sign up and know what's coming up. Okay. Now I had put, I put the, uh, your website on there just before, but I wanted to, uh, put up the other website where people can try to find out some more. And, uh, the link is a little long here, but what yeah. I'm going to do, <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm just going to on up on YouTube. I can just paste the link here so that people can, uh, uh, get access to it as well. Um, would you mind taking a question? Uh, cause I've got somebody, uh, it's popped up here. Yeah, uh, this, this is from uh, Janet Young here, uh, and uh, she's in Ottawa. And she asks, uh, could you ask what happens with the remains once the decomposition research is complete? Let me just put this over here. And hi, Janet. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks, Janet. It's an excellent question. Um, there's a few options, in fact. So uh, some of our donors have decided, so most of our donors, well, I should say all of our donors, consent during life and, and they sign up to our program during life. Um, we ask that they talk to their family uh, about their decision and one of the discussion points is that their family can receive their remains, cremated remains, at the end of the project. Uh, we tell them that would be a maximum of three years and if their family wants that to happen, then we make sure we, we follow that, um, that decision. Uh, so some of our donors are what we call short-term studies because three years for us is short-term. Um, and then other donors tell us that their family have said, no, they don't want the, the remains returned. They're happy for the donor to stay as long as we need them. And so they'll be our long-term studies where we'll look for five or ten years to see longitudinally what's what's happening. Um, and both are equally important. You know, there's there's 
Um, a lot of short-term studies we need in terms of fingerprints, DNA, soft tissue. And then there's the long-term, what happens to the bone over time, teeth, hair, uh, those kinds of materials that last much longer. Um, both are found and, and both are extremely valuable. So I hope that answers the question. That's, that's generally what happens with um, our donors. So far, nothing. Uh, all five donors are still there, thankfully. Um, we're only four or five months into the process. And I mean, once you once you eventually are done with one or two or, or whatever, I mean, are you, is there like a, a you got like a stock <laughs> that you go to kind of thing? Or is it just at the time you wait and then whoever is available at the time you kind of. Oh, in terms of new donors, new arriving? donors, yeah, yeah. Is yeah, it yeah. So, um, so well, I guess so. In case people are interested in the process, how it works is they consent during life. Uh, they're given a donor card. Um, they're told to speak to their family or lawyer, whoever's going to manage the the process. Often, it's the hospital or a palliative care. Um, and we usually get notice uh, about twenty four hours in advance uh, once they've they've died and and that the family is still in agreement for them to come. Uh, that's a particularly important point. The family can choose to rescind the donation if they're not in agreement at that time. It's why we stress that the family should be made aware of this prior to death. Um, but then we have, yeah, maybe 24 hours notice, sometimes less, uh, where a funeral service will, will transport them to our um, anatomy laboratory for processing and that's simply registering and, and cleaning and, and removal of anything that might be returned to the family. And then they come straight to us. Uh, we're only 20 minutes from our campus and the facility that is. Um, and so, yeah, it all happens relatively quickly. Um, means we're always on standby, but I'm sure, you know, most police and forensic scientists are aware of that anyway, familiar with that. Yeah. Uh, and as soon as they arrive, we start collecting data. So, yeah, they're, they're, we just uh, basically, there's always a need to collect data. Um, we, we say we wouldn't accept a donor unless we had a project ready, but we always have projects. We always need more odour data. We need more fingerprint data. We need So at this stage, there's really no reason um, that we wouldn't have research ready to commence immediately. Is, is it rather difficult right now for other universities or, or whatever across Canada or something to collaborate with you on certain things or is there still <laughs> opportunities? Yeah? yeah, I hope not. If there's difficulties, then I, I need to fix them. Um, we're very collaborative. We're all about collaboration. Uh, most people just send me an email, tell me what they're thinking, and we start the discussion. And, uh, you know, there's a process, of course. We have to go through ethics approval for all of our projects, and that's really important. Um, but, no, we definitely don't want to prohibit any kind of collaboration um, within reason. There's, there's some restrictions. Uh, ultimately, we have an executive committee that reviews all project proposals and, and makes sure that ethically um, they, they agree with those. But otherwise, yeah, I just encourage people to contact me through the website or through my email. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, look, I, uh, yeah, I think that's fantastic. I think the work you're doing is super cool. Uh, like I was thinking last night, I said, you know, people think CSI and all that stuff is cool, but the people in forensics think what you're doing is cool. So uh, I think it's fantastic. It's great work. And I love the fact that it's sort of, you know, new and, and you know, cutting edge and you have uh, so much opportunity here. And I'm also proud of the fact that Canada actually has, you know, a, a, a facility like this. So I think it's fantastic. I, I hope that in the future we can get more and um, get more students access to this sort of thing because I, I think it's super helpful and, and it's not... Uh, you know, I, I realize with some people, they may find it uncomfortable, whatever, but from a, from a professional standpoint, it's something that's necessary. If you don't have access to it, there's just no way to study. Absolutely. So, hey, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Um, hang back for a second, if you don't mind, because I'll, I'll catch up with you on the on the back end, and I'm just going to make a quick closing, and, and then we'll go from there. Thank no you so much. Problem. Thanks a lot. Uh, all right, folks. Well, that does it for this uh, episode. And uh, next week, I'm going to have Dr. Alfredo Eugene Walker. Yes, we have his middle name is the same as my name. And uh, he's a forensic, a forensic pathologist from Ottawa. And uh, we're going to be talking about forensic pathology and uh, the role that he plays and the contribution that forensic pathology has in forensics. So on that note, I want to say thank you very much uh, for watching today. Um, we are going to be back next week, Thursday at 2 p.m. Take care. Thank you. Uh -huh.